And here we are, episode 47. 47, yeah. What's been going on? Well, uh, a few things. I was uh, actually presented at uh, the men's conference in New Zealand over Zoom this time. Uh, yesterday, so it was 8 a.m. It was 11 a.m. in, uh, in um, New Zealand, 8 a.m. my time. Uh, Mike Buchanan also presented at the conference too. I haven't had a chance to... I've been chatting to him about some other stuff, but I haven't had a chance to chat to him about the conference actually. But uh, yeah, it was, it, I think it went really well. I was very happy with my presentation I went to the conference in New Zealand physically last year, uh, the what they called the Men's Summit. I really love M-E-N-Z-C, Men's Summit, see what they did there. So, uh, and I went to the physically last year. That was fantastic. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it so again next year. But this year, alas, for various reasons, it wasn't practical. So, But I was at least able to present over Zoom. Uh, and my presentation, which will be posted on a Voice for Men in the very near future, within possibly the next couple of hours, uh, was related to uh, misandry and feminism. And it's quite, it's quite quote heavy, this one. And I told you, you can see uh, real trends with the, with the, uh, the misandric quotes and, uh, and, uh, and so forth of, of going right back Go right back to the Declaration of Sentiments uh, and, and so forth, and then right through to uh, to uh, Barack and Michelle Obama. So, of course, right. Now, uh, before we get things completely kicked off, um, there's something I wanted to try here. So, mm -hmm. I found Oreo Coca Cola, Coke Zero. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I wanted to try this thing, but um, by the time I figured out that they were um, doing it, I think they were away from uh, the, sh the shelves in our uh, market. So I kind of wanted to give this a quick taste test. Oh, okay. Things. So this is sort of a live taste yeah. test. Is that, is yep. that right? I, I've never tried this one, but I have been curious. And uh, don't let the busy busy busybodies tell you otherwise. Sometimes it's okay to have one soda every so often. So Agreed. Yes. I'm uh, I'm not a oh, fan yeah. of but I don't mind a, a vanilla coke occasionally. Mm. I'm gonna wait for an aftertaste here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, it's more more of an aftertasty kind of a thing. It's just a it doesn't kind of come at you all at once. Kind of okay. kind of wait wait till it lingers on to get any kind of hint of Oreo. Um, it's like, like a more subtle version of the, the vanilla Coke. Uh, okay. so yeah. 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 Well, not, not too, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. No, cool. Well, yeah. Glad, uh, glad you, you did a live, a <laughs> yes. live taste yeah. test. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We could have done like a, a blind taste test or something and got someone you know, there and, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just figured it'll be a fun way to kind of kick things off, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, let's get started. <laughs> what you got? So yeah, so that was the men's conference. Uh, uh, I, um, I was, as I said, very happy with my presentation. Uh, a lot of the quotes that we had uh, that, I, that I put in the presentation were already on a Voice for Men uh, or in Wiki for Men as well. Uh, they're ones that I've researched over over the um, in the past. Uh, some other people have, have done research on Wiki for Men on those quotes as too. In fact, a couple of years ago, a gentleman from Finland. Uh, who has an account on Wiki for Men went right through and uh, was very careful to f and, and found uh, sources for a, for a lot of the quotes and verified them all and so forth. So that was really great. Uh, so we we're able to really shore up the quotes there and, and have solid sources for them. So, but I think uh, if anybody were to look at that presentation or look at the the, the uh, uh, look at the uh, at the written presentation when I when I put it on a Voice for Men. Anyone who's not familiar with those quotes, I think, would be quite shocked because when you, some of them are, are really, I mean, they, uh, 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 they've got, for example, Simone de, de Beauvoir uh, talking about, you know, 10 men being reduced to 10% of the population, that sort of thing. We're familiar with that sort of thing, but a lot of people aren't. So uh, I, I think that, uh, yeah, if anyone who's not familiar with those quotes, they'd probably be quite shocked. So that was the men's conference, and uh, I've also got a couple of other items I was going to mention, but I believe you've got a few items this time. Something to do uh, with yeah, let's uh, do, do this thing where we're kind of like like tagging off each other, like like you do something, I do one. Um, All right. Okay. So, so yeah. So, well, I've done so, one. So, so, sorry, are you doing are doing one more? Or am I doing one? Uh, why don't you jump in? Okay, sounds good. So, um, 
this was uh, inspired by a recent comment on uh, on our late latest video, um, and, and it went something along the lines of I'm trying to pull it out now. Let's see if I can do this fast enough. Um, that the, the the remark basically was that uh, women can't be held accountable. Uh, Let's stop this insane. Ex okay, okay, so here it is. I got it. Women can't be held accountable. Time to pull the plug on this insane social, social experiment. So I think your um, uh, did this person's uh, intent was uh, uh, basically trying to bring light to the, the non accountability of women, uh, uh, but with all uh, respect uh, uh, to the to this uh, individual, um, I, I would like to respond. So. As you guys know, in our sphere regarding the subject of uh, relations between men, women, society, and so forth, we come across that phrase, phrase right? Women can't be held accountable. Um, so I'm going to ask everyone to examine that a bit closer. Uh, it's can't be held accountable, not must be held accountable. You know, um, but here's the problem with can't. Uh, it's dangerous because it, uh, when stated uh, inside our men's issues sphere, um, it kind of precludes men's rights in essence, if that makes sense. Because um, what men's uh, rights and men's issues awareness and resolution is, is that you know we're trying to eliminate the the double standard of the sexes, right? And that's you know that's something that uh, uh, accountability is like a huge thing. If we, if we admit that they can't be, then we, we admit that we that men are always going to be in the dirt. So it's kind of like a consignment yeah. of that. So, you know, if we remain in the status of disposable and women in the simultaneously fragile and exalted and perfect. So women can't be held accountable. It's almost, it almost sounds like a feminist end goal, you know, and by and large, the guy in the centrist's uh, uh, end goal. So with respect to this commenter, let's not give in to this. You know, um, yeah. uh, let's keep on... Uh, fighting that fight to convince women to abandon non-accountability. You know, I know it sounds naive to the more hardline people out there, but I think this is the truth. The truth as I see it, I think it needs to be. I, I absolutely agree. In fact, uh, my view is that uh, we must, uh, if, if we're going to have legal and social equality, and legal and social equality doesn't in any way imply that people are the same, merely that they have the same rights and responsibilities before the law mm -hmm. and are treated the same in society. But if we're going to have that, then uh, we need to treat people the same, even when we recognise that they have different capabilities. So even if we recognise that there are differences between men and women, and that's going to manifest in, in, in the work life or whatever it happens to be, uh, maybe, for example, we know that women on average don't cope as well with stress, and that may have an impact. So, But nevertheless, legal and social equality requires us to treat people the same before the law, and in society, and that's the way I viewed it, and that means equal accountability, mm -hmm. even when you recognise that there are differences. Right, exactly. And I would suggest that's a core point in uh, men's rights and a voice mm -hmm. for men, and one right. and one of the areas that really attracted me. Right, because exactly. one of the things, and I think a lot of people don't realise this, is that uh, you've got you've got feminists say. Uh, and 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 they're, and they're trying to to uh, you know uh, eliminate uh, women being held accountable to a large degree. They've succeeded in society. You've got uh, you've got conservatives on the other side who are also trying to give women special treatment. And there's a small group of people in the middle who are saying no. People should be treated the same before the law. It's what a lot of people claim. It's all what a lot of feminists claim they're, they're saying, but you're interested in enjoying that. Uh, the, uh, I'll comment in a moment, but finish your sentence. Yeah, but it's, it's what a lot of people, a lot of feminists will claim they're doing, right? But we know they're not really doing. Right, exactly. And uh, it, so, yeah, that's why I come, we need to kind of highlight that importance of the yes. difference between can't and must not. Because yes. must not it's, is a full recognition that, uh, you know, Women, you no. Know, women can be accountable. It's been yes. proven. It's been done. But that's right. Too many can aren't doing it. Can and yes. should. That's right. Right. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Exactly. Uh, uh, so yeah. Yeah, you, this is a fundamental point in men's rights. But you're probably right. It's not something that is explicitly stated enough. Mm -hmm. so we yeah. Sure. And 
we ought to explicitly state it. I I, I think that's something that we should should be doing more more. But yeah. Um. And once again, no no disrespect intended to the commenter uh, uh of the person who gives us feedback because feedback is always good. Um. But you know, uh, this is something I felt like I wanted to make a pretty clear response to uh, uh on the camera. So. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And as I said, this is. Uh, one of the things that first attracted me to a voice for men uh, because this was the position of the people who were who were running the site at the time uh, and it was something that that it was it was and is relatively rare at the moment still there are a lot of people who espouse equality but will actually give women special treatment and that is not equality at all mm -hmm. right yeah absolutely yeah yeah uh before we move on to your next subject so um I took a bigger swig of this thing, like like a much bigger one this time. And the reaction was different this time because that was when it was like biting into an Oreo. Uh, and it, so it was much, so, so like if I kind of slow swig it, uh, not quite the same effect. It's more accurate, tasty, but take a huge one, then you're biting into an Oreo. I, okay. I, 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 fin right. I finally got that. And, and for the Fair record, enough. I haven't had an Oreo in years. So, you know, um, so uh, so it's not like I'm like gorging on this stuff all the time or anything like that. So, so stop freaking out. Um, but yeah, uh, I figured I'd make a clarification there. Anyway, uh, pass it on to you. Oh, great. I was going to say, as I said earlier, I, I don't mind, don't really like Coke, but I don't mind the occasional vanilla Coke, although mm -hmm. there's a lot of sugar in there, obviously. I don't think I've ever tried a lime Coke actually, but it's not really, it doesn't really attract me. So yeah. Um, I might've had the, the lime coke ages ago i think so so not long after our last episode a uh, uh there was a bit of an explosion in the australian media a woman by the name of lydia thorpe who i might have mentioned before she's an australian senator she uh has indigenous australian heritage exactly how much uh there seems to be a quest bit of a question about uh, possibly a great-grandparent or a great-great-grandparent or something like that. But anyway, she identifies as an Indigenous Australian, an Australian Aborigine, uh, and uh, that's very much part of her identity. And it, I think it'd be fair to say she, she very much buys into identity politics. Anyway, uh, she um, re refers to uh, uh, the Australian state as the, colon as, as the colony, so the, the nation of Australia, she actually refers to as the colony, and she talks a lot about how uh, about the Indigenous Australians were colonised by the British and so forth. So anyway, uh, a couple of weeks ago, or just a little bit after our last broadcast, I said, uh, the King of Australia, in uh, who is King Charles III, was in Australia. Now, I want to make something clear here. Um, I am uh, an avowed Australian Republican. Now, that has a different meaning to an American Republican. The United yes, States... Yes. Republicanism, Republicans are, are the Republican Party is a political party. In Australia, there's no such political party. If an Australian says they're Republican, they mean they want an Australian Republic. In 1999, we voted on a republic in Australia. I voted for the republic. Uh, we did not get a republic for, for various reasons. Uh, some people, some Republicans didn't like the model that was proposed and voted against it. So a majority of the population at the time wanted a republic, but enough people didn't like the proposed model. That it didn't didn't pass. Anyway, uh, so I say this as someone. You now I expect there will be a Republican vote again in Australia in a few years, and I expect to vote again for a Republican. This time I think it will pass. But until that day happens, Australia is a constitutional monarchy, and King Charles III is the King of Australia. Uh, and as a bit of an aside there, there's something called the Statute of Westminster 1931, which I think I have mentioned before. Uh, it used to be that the British monarch was the king or queen of England, or could, actually, no, I shouldn't say that, uh, king or queen of, of the United Kingdom, because there hasn't been a king or queen of England for hundreds of years, actually. King or queen of the United Kingdom, uh, and usually United Kingdom and Ireland, or then later the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. Okay. Uh, and also Emperor of India. Okay, that was also a title that the monarch had, but it was already it was already pretty clear by the 1920s that the empire, British Empire, was on the way out, and they they really needed to do something, figure out what they were going to do. So the uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom met with the Prime Ministers of 
all the independent Commonwealth realms at the time, all those, I should say, countries in the empire, and they decided that they would reform the way the uh, crown worked. And they, this is where the Statute of, Statute of Westminster 1931 comes from. It was a, a law that was passed in the UK and in all the other realms, I believe, also, uh, so that they, all agree, they were all in agreement. And it basically defined the monarch as the monarch of uh, the king or the queen of each separate country in, that was in at the time was it part of the British Empire. So uh, that's why King Charles is king of Australia. If the, United, if the United Kingdom were to become a republic tomorrow, he would still be king of Australia and he would still be king of Canada and New Zealand and Jamaica and so forth. And that's because of the way that they did this. So he is the king of Australia. And until we have that Republican vote, which I will vote for, that will continue to be the case. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lydia Thorpe, Senator Thorpe, uh, uh, said he is not my king. She publicly said he is not my king. Now, this is a really interesting statement for an Australian senator to make because in order to be a senator in Australia and sit in the parliament or a member of the House of Representatives, because our houses are named exactly the same as yours and that in the United States, and that's because we've got the names from you, by the way. Uh, in order to do that, it is necessary for that individual to swear allegiance to the monarch, their heirs and successors. Now, right. Lydia thought did do that okay and i'll get to that in a moment because some there was a bit of a there were some issues around that as well but the statement not my king would appear on the surface to be a renunciation of the oath right and if she's renounced the oath she's no longer eligible to sit in parliament now once she realized that, that, that this was something that people were talking about she started to step back but she took an, a really interesting argument on this she said, I didn't renounce the, and, and, and I honest, honestly, this is what she said, and I posted this on A Voice for Men uh, about a week and a half ago. She said, I didn't renounce the oath because I didn't make it in the first place, which is a really interesting argument to make because everyone else realises that the end result is the same. She's still ineligible to sit in Parliament, but apparently she didn't realise that straight away. What she actually said and if you look back in the original record, and I posted on it, this is what I posted on Voice If you look at the original record, recording from a few years ago, she actually said she um, she deliberately mispronounced words during the oath and said heirs and successors instead of heirs and successors. Now, I want to say, I want to make a point, uh, a, a point of order almost about this now. I noticed that at the time. I remember when that happened, and I was amazed that the president of the Senate accepted the oath, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a second attempt because the first time she um, said some of the words incorrectly and, it was, and the oath was rejected and she went to do it again and then she mispronounced the words. I was amazed they accepted it, and I was amazed that the Australian media didn't pick up on it. Well, 2024 comes about. She says these things to King Charles. Suddenly everybody's taking notice of what she said two years ago, even though uh, that, that's something that should have been raised at the time. But anyway, yes, apparently, so her, her argument was that when she said heirs and successors, she was not, so it was Queen Elizabeth at the time, so she pledged allegiance to Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors. She was claiming she did not, in fact, pledge allegiance to King Charles. But apparently she didn't realise what everybody else realised, that the net result would be the same and she still would be sitting in Parliament illegally. So she, now she's taken a step back from that as well. <laughs> so I complained to the president of the Senate. I sent an email to the president's office and received an email back a couple of days later from one of their staff members basically saying that the president of the Senate can't do anything. I've, I complained to my MP uh, and uh, the response I got from my MP was that, 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 that um, the government is taking it seriously. So it will be interesting to see what comes out of that. But... Uh, now, I also want to comment, and I, I made this point to, to my MP, uh, Israel had a problem where they had people in their parliament, the Knesset, explicitly calling for the destruction of the state or explicitly calling for violence against the country. And so they've had to toughen up their laws on this regard. And I think perhaps Australia and other Western countries might have to start doing the same thing. If we've got disloyal members of parliament or we've got, uh, we've got parliamentarians calling for the dismantling of the state, 
then I think we're going to have to be much more strict and make sure that they that they really are uh, that they are swearing allegiance to the state and that they are uh, that they're they're following through on they're following that. So more that we we haven't heard the last uh, last on the, on this uh, story yet. Right. So was this something she actually deliberately did or is something she's claiming to do because she was falling back on that particular argument? Well, she initially, when she said heirs and successors, she initially claimed that that was deliberate and, that, and thus she hadn't sworn allegiance to, to King Charles. Mm -hmm. But then when she realized that might mean she can't sit in parliament, she said that uh, she doesn't speak English as well as others. And, uh, and uh, as a result, she just mispronounced the word. So within 24 hours, she backflipped on that. Yeah. And uh, then it kind of went quiet. That was about a week ago. Uh, but as I said, I, I, the, the information I've received from my MP is that the government's taking the matter seriously. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, for sure. Uh, oh, I guess in other news, there's been a state election in Australia, the state of Queensland, which is the state I live in. Uh, interestingly enough, there's been a shift to the right in in the in the uh, and now Queensland's already the most probably the most conservative state in Australia. There's been a shift to the right, though. Interestingly enough, the the uh, centre left party lost votes to the centre right party, and the far left party, the Greens, lost votes to the centre left party. So there's sort of generally a shift in in the right direction. But I want to remind everybody at this point uh, that uh, there are, and I've said I keep saying this, there are plenty of people who are anti woke. On the left, people. A lot of people make the mistake of assuming woke and anti-woke is the same as left and right. It really isn't. While people who are anti-woke, while people who are conservative tend to be anti-woke, there are also anti-woke people on the left, and I can give examples yeah. of that. Yeah, there are anti-woke people on the left, and uh, too often, to my dismay, I've seen that there are some people on the right that kowtow too much to the woke. Yes, they may not be woke themselves, but you're right; they kowtow to it. Absolutely right. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, which in my mind is just as bad if you're in that position. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, my feeling is that we are seeing a shift. I think we may have reached peak woke. Um, I, I, that's just the sense I get. I'm not naturally an optimist, but uh, just from what I'm seeing uh, on the ground, the voice referendum in Australia failing last year, uh, the shift in the Queensland election here, things that are going on in other countries as well, I think we're seeing a shift away from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something to pay attention to. Yes. Uh, what's your next? All question? right. All right. So um, I figured I'd cover a few uh, uh, recent deaths this past two weeks of, uh, of people uh, I, I would like to m mention. So the first one is that, well, if, if there's any... Uh, uh, listeners of our podcast that are into Iron Maiden... Um, uh, Iron Maiden's first singer, Paul Diano, passed away. He is sang, sang on the first two albums. Um, uh, so he's not, he's probably not as well represented as uh, Bruce Dickinson, who is just the most famous and most consistent singer of Iron Maiden. But uh, uh, the two albums he worked on are still considered to be iconic. Uh, if you if you like uh, the songs like Wrathchild or Phantom of the Opera, uh, that's him singing on it. Uh, and he's he's done a few live albums too, including Made in Japan, uh, which is uh, probably their most well known of the Paul Diano era. But yeah, um, I figured I'd kind of th uh, throw that out there. He's been having like a lot of health issues, like towards the end of his uh, career, doing his own thing. Uh, he was singing from a wheelchair uh, on stage, so so he's been having like a lot of uh, yeah. problems. Okay. And I'm I'm pretty sure this was more like a accumulation of the of, of the problems so he passed away uh, uh on the 21st october and so yeah that so that's um some new, uh, news there and also on the, the the acting and movie side of things uh, uh actress terry gar has passed away um uh, from complications of multiple sclerosis uh, on the, the 29th terry gar uh uh, some some Trek fans will recognize her as the as Gary Seven's sidekick in the episode Assignment Earth and many yes. many yes and um and pro I think more people probably know her for being uh, uh Gene Wilder's uh, assistant in Young Frankenstein Mel Brooks film right 
She was in quite a few movies, actually. I, I have seen her in some other shows, but you're right. She, of course, was Gary Seven's uh, sidekick. That's right. Yeah. For those So, who don't know... so yeah, suppose supposedly uh, her experience working with Gene Roddenberry wasn't all that great because she kept mess messing with her wardrobe or something like that, uh, making it kind of dumb looking, I think. And she Uh, she did not uh, uh, want to talk about Trek from that point on. I uh, it I, like yeah, it's it's whatever. I I still liked her in that role. It was a pretty funny role. They were going to make a spin off of Gary Seven and her, but it never materialized. So. Those things can be found in books and comic books instead. Um, uh, but yeah, um, I think more, more, I think she's more proud of and is more known for stuff like Young Frankenstein. In fact, the story, as I understand it, is that the Gary Seven series was being developed separately to Star Trek and partly to boost the, the potential ratings and partly to allow them to do a backdoor pilot, they decided to incorporate it into the Star Trek universe. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, have, have that have that backdoor pilot. I would have uh, would have I would have liked to have seen it. I think it would have been a good good series in the sixties. I'm sure it would have been something I would have watched as Sure, a kid. sure. Well, um, Gary Seven and, and Roberta, that's Terry Gar's character, were um, main characters in a book series called The Rise and Fall of Khan Yun and Singh. Uh, so, so that's not canonical material, but uh, Gary Seven uh, uh, had a lot to do with trying to investigate the eugenics wars of, you know, you know, Khan. And uh, so uh, um, in re I, I read the first book and in retrospect, it, it tried to cram a lot of uh, uh, what do you call it? Original series tropes. Cause um, there was uh, that immortal guy, Flint from uh, uh, Requiem from Methuselah as, as like some, as some other character. And um, I think uh, the, the, the entity of Jack the Ripper was in it too. So they were like mashing everything into the, into that one. I just remember that, but um, yeah, um, I, maybe I should read it again and look at it with fresh eyes. And I didn't even finish uh, uh, the whole story anyway, uh, because I never got around to it, but uh, yeah, uh, those will be the places to look into um, Gary Seven's adventures. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. But yes, I would have loved another. Would have loved that as a series. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all in terms of uh, celebrity deaths that I've got. So let's pass it on to you. Yeah, thank you. So the final one I've got is Boeing. Apparently, they're closing their DEI department, but uh, with the caveat that their DEI department is being merged into HR. So, but it's it's certainly being painted. A lot of sources are saying that this is that it's, they're wrapping up the DEI. And they're focusing on merit. I think what they're saying is that those employees will now be re, basically re, reassigned as regular HR employees and will, will do HR work. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think it, like I was saying before with the work, I, I think DEI is starting to wind down. Uh, there's there's a lot of people in the, in the the broader community are finally starting to realize what we've known for a very long time that it's dangerous and that it's and that that is it is everywhere and it is, it is throughout the universities and the throughout governments and so forth. Uh, and I've personally had interactions with people in the government. I've been surprised by some of the things they've said in terms of how readily many of them uh, buy into work concepts. Uh, it's it's quite concerning, but. Anyway, I do think that it is starting to wind down uh, as uh, these companies are finding that they're, they have, they're running into problems and, uh, and the, the anti-woke, I think, and I've been saying this for many years, I think they have much longer memories than woke people. So in, in the sense that if, like, for example, I, I, I don't, still don't buy Gillette, for example. And I, just recently, I've seen a number of men say that they still don't buy Gillette. And so yeah, I don't. I, I don't. The wokies have moved on. They've forgotten about it, right? But the, if you annoy people with that sort of thing, they like I'm I'm never buying Gillette again. So you know, it doesn't matter what Gillette does oh, at this yeah. point, right? Um, they will remember for a very long time. So I think it's very dangerous for for, for companies to 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 do this, and it's absolutely astounding to me that so many have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just don't get it. They just don't seem to beat it into their heads, you know. Uh, so that's all I have, apart from, of course, Zoe McClellan, who I will mention, as I always do. And uh, yeah, yes, sure. I, mentioned, I mentioned Zoe McClellan in my New Zealand presentation again. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Um, I think I might want to cap off with a few other things. So, mm. so 
I was kind of, uh, you know, you know, I was watching Star Trek yesterday, actually, which I thought about uh, including Terry Gar because she recently passed away, and, and it was Assignment Earth that I last watched, um, and it got it got it really got me thinking. Um, and I, uh, recently, I made a, a a tweet that's not really, um, uh, I, I don't think a lot of people saw this one, but um, so and, and this is kind of a reflection on me thinking at the time, um, is that. Old Trek, okay, so, so this, is, this is my tweet. Uh, uh, old Trek sparked the imagination of young people and inspired them in their lives. New Trek is for hipsters who enter it and nerd culture with cynical intent. So that's kind of like the big, so and, and kind of falling off on your, on, on the woke, anti-woke thing. Woke tends to be hipsters with cynical intent. Like whenever they try to change things to make it more woke, uh it's not like they were ever fans of the source material in the sense that you and i must have been you know they're just hipsters they want to make it more fashion ironically fashionable uh, hipsters and fashion is kind of a weird relation but you know it's like this this new construct of nerd culture just seems more hipsterish to me because it's really um it's not any sincere uh interest in a given man like every time i see some celebrity saying that oh you might have not known that i actually play dungeons and dragons i don't believe them necessarily well i mean i don't believe that they grew up doing this kind of thing uh, maybe i'm way off base maybe they are but the way it comes across is that you know uh, they're trying to make it really fashionable and trying to appeal to that audience that's why they're saying that they have a DD session every so often or uh, oh yeah, yeah we watch star trek and that's why we have all this homage and fan service related stuff that was the jj abrams star trek movies and you know uh even worse more politically correct uh retardedness that is anything that came after that so yeah um yeah a lot of the things that i enjoyed going growing up were very fringe then that was nerd culture so i did play dandy when i was a kid for example yeah, yeah this sure. was like, you did right but Exactly. Yeah. No, no, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know what you're getting at with you're saying that it's now it's virtue signaling. And I want to say that I, I was playing D&D in the era when we were still battling the claim that it led people to suicide. OK, uh, even though that was utter nonsense, I, I it was banned at my school at one point, for example. So this was stuff that was going on. So so we, we met resistance. Right. Uh, board games. I mean, that's now mainstream. That's great. You know, but uh, there's a lot of other Star Trek. A lot of these things have gone mainstream, and uh, you're right. It's it's quite different. It's not the fringe culture that it was, right? Uh, where so it's probably not, it's not really nerd culture anymore. It's really pop culture now, actually. Yeah, a lot of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're now they're bullying people uh, out of what we used to belong to uh, do our best to belong to. You know, because that's yeah. That's it. And, yeah. Um, right. Yeah. You were going to add something. Oh no, just just that the the the, yeah. the things that were very nerdish are now quite mainstream. Right. Yeah. So because you know, back then you know, uh, when Trek first came out, it was already an endangered species because you know it's like you yes. know, they, good, right, right. They were um, you know uh, trying to get the, keep the show running, you know, and it and as we know, it got canceled after the third season, and yeah, and it actually it actually very came very close to being canceled after the second season. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, wasn't it just just fans that it was a, there was a letter writing campaign. I think yeah. that must have been one of the the, the, the letter, and it was one of the few first few examples. Like it was a very early example of that actually, uh, and it right. demonstrated. Yeah, but it didn't make much money until it was in syndication. Oddly enough, well, it wasn't yeah. That popular. Yeah, it, exactly. It was a it was a completely fan crafted um, sort of thing that was, you know. Once it found success, it kind of got co-opted. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, it was like the first kind of adult thing that I really was into, you know, like, you know, um, more, you know, you know, it's, it's, you know, something where dark subjects were pretty, uh, you know, but, but done in a, you know, a really uh, eloquent way too, for the most part. Yeah, it's true. Well, it is. What well, it did deal with a lot of adult concepts, and a lot of us at the time who were watching it were kids. You're right. I guess some some things would have gone over our heads. 
Mm But uh, yeah, you're probably right. It was probably one of the first adult things that I was into as well. -hmm. Yeah, right. Uh, I remember seeing an interview of um, a television presenter named John Tesh um, uh, saying that when he was a kid, I think uh, his parents allowed him one TV program to watch because I, I guess his household was semi strict. And he always picked Star Trek because, you know, Nice. just you're Yeah. right. And he later on, he actually had like a A cameo as as like some some Klingon in a Next Generation episode. So, Uh, while we're on the topic, and I don't, I hadn't prepped, so I don't recall the gentleman's name, but there was yeah. a a guy who actually was in the original Star Trek series as a baby, okay, and he was actually in later series as well, and they've actually put him in a couple of other series as well since. Uh, so he's actually been in quite a number of series, uh, including the original series. The only baby I can think of in um, the original series was uh, Baylock. The, the he's the one that talked. Uh, he was on the Corbomite maneuver. That's right, and that's 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 the actor. Yeah, right. Uh, try, I'm Yeah. doing a really quick look at uh, who the actor That's was. not him. Try, like uh, Clint Howard. Clint Howard. That, that's the that's the guy. And he played uh, some. Uh, uh, I think uh, some. bum in a Nick in a deep space nine episode or something like that i i, I don't know Okay. some Yeah, yeah and since then uh, they've put him on quite a number of series in the in new mm -hmm. tracks. yeah At least that's that. Yeah, that's cute. yeah yeah it, it was entertaining what you know watching ba the baylock you know, <laughs> how did he get this child to speak you know, it was it Yes. was pretty yeah yeah Yes. it was fun to So imagine I do find it interesting that he was an actor as a baby and then chose acting as well as an adult, apparently. So, because as a baby, it would have been his parents making that choice. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, while we're on the topic of Trek, one thing that bothers me, and, and this has bothered me since Enterprise, okay, Okay. is that. Um, I, I, to me, the classic Trek fans, it's all about world building. So the type of people who, who, who would have been the original Trek fans are interested, they, they want to imagine this as a real world that exists and it's not just what's on the screen, there's stuff going on behind the scenes. And so it's all about world building, you need a consistency and so forth. So I think for Enterprise, I think it shouldn't have been a ship with the name Enterprise. They should have given it another name with its own story. And now with Strange New Worlds, Again, it's the same crew on the same ship, and it, why do that? Make a new ship. If you want to do it, and want to be, if you want it in the same era, fine. But Yeah. Right. make it a different ship with a different crew, with different stories, Mm -hmm. Right. with a different history, world building. But they're, they're not doing it. They keep recycling the same characters. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Now, um, uh, Star Trek Enterprise, and it really was just called Enterprise when it first started. It It is was. the That's is right. the it is the last Star Trek series that I will uh I would defend because everything else after it is is indefensible. But uh, I tend to be a defender of Star Trek Enterprise, but even when it first came out, uh, and I think Voyager was winding down at the time, um, I did think that should have picked a different name to Enterprise. There's there's already been six Enterprises kind of going Yeah. going forward in the in the world of of, of this of the show. So something else is okay now. One thing I'll say about Star Trek Discovery, even though I despise the show, Discovery is not a bad name for a ship. Um, it is the only thing I will give it. The only thing But I the will name give is it. all right. Right, yeah. Uh, on the topic of the Enterprise, as in as in uh, Archer's Enterprise, it, it caused a continuity problem too. Because while they, although they've, I think they've tried to argue that it didn't, basically in the original series, uh, you see a series of models of ships named Enterprise for uh, for the Federation previously. Okay, and some of those right. So. Uh, and some of those models turn up even in other places, but uh, Archer's Enterprise isn't there, okay? Right. And that, But the argument that's been made, or the way they've tried to defend that, is by claiming that it wasn't, it was, while it was a Starfleet vessel, it was pre-Federation, and that's why it didn't count, right? Right. But I think that's, Yes. I kind of think that's the thin end of the wedge. Uh, Mm because -hmm. Starfleet, Yes. it was Starfleet, and therefore should have been counted. Anyway, that was, that was the argument they made. But if they had simply given it a different name, this was a non-problem. All Mm -hmm. sorts Yeah. of. Exactly. Yeah. And. <clears throat> And um, once again, as a as an as what a, who is often a defender of Enterprise, um, some other issues is that they were playing with fire when it comes to uh, I'm sorry. uh, 
like like con continuity like you know um the episode where the where the the Borg from first contact were discovered in the ice that was dangerous It because was. That's right. right They could, like like, like they never next generation named it on, and that's why they didn't know it was the same species. Yeah. yeah Sorry, but cut. they should have predicted it like you know like they knew that they were they even said to, you know we probably haven't seen the last of them so why were they absolutely flummoxed on the episode q who of uh next generation when q uh gave him kind of like a a head start in expo in, in exposing them you know so um Exactly. And they got a good yeah look at them, so they would have known, they would have had information right in their historical database about these aliens that they'd right encountered on Earth. Yes. Yeah, the other episode As you say, they're playing with fire. Go on. exactly. They're, they're more. They're, they were still playing with fire when it comes to the Ferengi. Rocket They had an episode with the Ferengi. Oh. Yeah, uh, and you know, I don't care that they weren't named. You know, <laughs> um, Yes. um, And they also they played with fire with the Romulans. very much so. Yeah, I know they they weren't they didn't show them because balance of terror. Of, of, um, uh, but by the way, I, I gotta. say something tangential i hope you people listening to this podcast are trek fans and know what the hell we're talking about <laughs> Exactly. but We're, <laughs> but we're assuming that people know enough about Trek uh, to to follow. Yes. mm -hmm. yeah yeah but but basically the romulans who are an offshoot of the vulcan people were not even shown uh to be who they are until episode nine of the, the original series though they did they did they did have a earth romulan war in which they didn't know what the Romans looked like. But I never saw Voyager, each of them, exactly. yeah. Uh, and also to the, the Vulcans, as you say, the Romulans were an offshoot of the Vulcans. The Vulcans themselves didn't know that the Romulans were an offshoot of their own species. Exactly, So yes. all they knew is some, some, some Vulcans had left thousands of years ago and they didn't know what happened to them. Uh, but Right, that were true. the ancestors of the Romulan, Romulan star Yeah. empire. Yeah, uh, and, a, and, a, and an amusing footnote is that we do see more Romulans than we see other Vulcans first, so... <laughs> Yes. I, I do want also to point out that I do... Think in the original series when the first when the Vulcans were sorry when the Romulans were first introduced, it was implied that the cloaking device was a new technology that the that the Federation was a little surprised that the Romulans had clo had cloaking technology, Yes. uh, whereas whereas in Enterprise uh, the Romulans are, are really using cloaking technology with 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 Yeah, with, with, yes, freely, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. so Yep. yeah. Uh, Yeah. so I think that may be a continuity problem because rather than just uh, I think they 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 cross the line there I believe uh, Mm hmm even though Yeah. so they sail very close to the wind a lot of times I think with that one they made a bit of a mistake. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh I, I'm still thinking they were, you know, uh like walking on cracks in the ice when they were keep they keep on introducing more species that are supposedly in good relations with the federation um uh that we don't retroactively see in any other you know we don't see denobulans ever in you know uh That's any right. anything outside of enterprise one awesome thing enterprise did and i probably said this before was that they did more with the andorians and the Tellarites. Right. So I yes was actually going to say, I wish they'd done more of that. And yes it's kind of surprising. And much as I also like Enterprise, I think it could have been a lot better. Enterprise should have been about that the humans encountering Andorians, encountering Tellarites, the species we've already met, But learning more about them because we don't actually know that much about them in a lot of cases. Right, Uh, yeah. so that's what it should, it should be about the politics. I think fourth, the fourth season should have been the second season, essentially. Uh, that they started to really get it right in the fourth season, but by then the ratings were so low that they essentially got it got cancelled. But yeah, the the fourth season I think was had some really good episodes. Uh, but I would I do want to clarify, I detest the temporal cold war. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So if you took Enterprise. Gave it a different ship name, uh, made it all about about them learning about near Earth species. Uh, then I think you would have had a much better show and, and dropped the temporal cold war completely. I think you would have had a much better show. Yeah, absolutely. They were jam packing new stuff so much. Like, I When they I did like something. the 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 Zindi arc, but I just don't know if it was appropriate for a prequel series. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really and like you, like you. I love the love the stuff with the Andorians because you learn so much about Andorians we didn't know. Tellarites Yes. too. Uh, there could have been a lot more of that, and there were plenty of other species that could have been mentioned as well.
So yeah, totally and they did, and, and I really like what they did with the Vulcans. Actually, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the idea that the Vulcans had actually strayed from the teachings of of uh, Sarek, uh, yeah. and 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 basically had to have a reassert a, a, a emergence of, the, of their of their philosophy again. I, I that I thought that was really neat. That was good. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So yeah, a bit of a mixed bag, I guess. But uh, overall, having rewatched it in the last few years, I do like it, with the exception yeah. of the temporal core. Yeah, sure. It is the final defensible Star Trek. Agreed. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I don't watch anything else afterwards. Nope. Uh, no. Yeah, I tried watching Discovery. I didn't even get. I didn't even get far enough to to be yeah to dislike it on the basis of it being woke. I found that I found it to be tedious. Uh, I I didn't manage a full episode. I think in the in of original, and then when it, when they did the third uh, season and I, and I heard they were going into the future, thirty first century, I gave it another go and I made about five minutes in because yeah. Michael had had two fights within the first five minutes and I was done. Right. Yeah. 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 What a dumb show. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. Yeah. What a disappointment. And I think I I probably mentioned previously with Picard. I actually uh, started watching it, and uh, I just one day the the latest episode came out, episode five or six or something, and I just didn't bother watching it. And a day passed, a week passed, a month passed, and I realised I just didn't care, and oh. I never watched it. I, I never made an explicit decision not to watch it again. I just didn't mm -hmm. care. Right. Yeah, I'm reminded of um, something that Orson Welles uh, said uh, to like I what I think is like a, some kind of forum or like some academy speech or something like that. It, I, I, don't, I don't remember the context of it, but it was him making a speech. Um, and basically what he flat out said was, um, I don't want to see another homage again. Kind of in the context of kind of advising people how to make films, you know, like he knows that, you know, people will keep on making films and so forth, but, you know, he doesn't want to see an homage again, basically just kind of like, like, you know, like uh, a reference to this or, you know, uh, yeah, it, it, or this time. or that, kind of like a re repeat or something like that. Kind of his yeah. way of saying, do something new, you know. Um, yes, that's right. I get what I understand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you yeah, can't no, escape think... the occasional homage, but uh, I think that's a good thing to aspire to. Do you know when he said that? I don't remember when he said Um. I mean, I can look at my YouTube history and see uh, what the uh, um, see if there's any. Um, maybe I can just do a search right now. Uh, um, Orson uh, Welles yeah, homage. Um, yeah, okay, so the the video I saw uh, it's 1982 is when he said it um, in a Paris in a Paris film school. Um, uh, if you can look on uh, YouTube, it's it's called Orson Welles on watching too many films. Um, okay. Some guy, mm -hmm. some guy called Antoine Petrov uh, uh, uploaded it, but yeah. And that's uh, so eighty two, and that's really at the start of all of this. So he was really picking up on that quite early, actually. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, they didn't heed his warning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be sure, because you no, know, back to the hipster stuff. Um, it's all bad homages, you know, it's yes. all reference, you know, and it's, it will kill anything it touches. It's killing Magic the Gathering right now. It's killed Star Trek. It's killed Star Wars. Um, you know, there's a right way to do a reference sometimes, but it, none of it is this. <laughs> You've got, that's right. You have to, you really have to be ju judicious with it. That's right. So occasional reference can work, can work really well, but if you overdo it, it's just terrible. Yes. Right, yeah. I'm a bit, I'm a bit concerned at the moment. I, I'm a great fan of Stargate, have been for a long time, mm -hmm. and they're talking about uh, doing another series or something, and I'm actually quite worried that they're yeah, sure. going to break it the way they did Star Trek and Star Wars. Oh, oh they're doing something new with Stargate? Apparently, they're, they're talking about it again. They might, they've might they been talking about it on and off for a long time, but just recently, I think there's something new possibly planned, in well, which case, but I'm actually quite concerned now. I hope they don't. It, well, um, Stargate is my wife's big thing so um i'll probably have to ask her about that i'm pretty sure she's going to hate anything woke like i do um but yes. you know um so yeah that's that's concerning but no that is my favorite series now uh, since, yeah. uh, since the late 90s yeah speaking of uh, uh i kind of want to segue into the last subject i actually had as um uh, so um just just basically mentioning that there's going to be so there has been a new Wallace and gromit movie um 
uh, from Ardman Animations. Um, all I can say is I hope it's really good because there's not a whole lot of movies I new movies that I'm uh, anticipating right now. The only thing I'm interested in seeing is the upcoming Sonic the Hedgehog because those were actually kind of okay. Um, but uh, but I love Wallace and Gromit. I love uh, Ardman Animations uh, movies. Um, And you know, this was already premiered in the American Film Institute, but uh, it'll be released on Netflix. And I gotta get a Netflix account, I guess. It sucks, um, but um, I think somebody will let me watch on their account. But uh, it'll be released on um, January third, uh, I think. It is uh, basically uh, a sequel to uh, what was it? Um, the Wrong Trousers, in which that 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 evil penguin uh, 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 with the With the the rubber glove as a chicken hat, uh, he'll be back. He's gonna seek revenge apparently. Uh, so at least that's something. I hope it's good. You know, in, in this day and age when I don't look forward to movies, I hope it's good. Yes, I, I think I've said before I don't I don't watch movies very much because I believe that uh, if, if people keep going to see the, the the rubbish that Hollywood puts out, that there's no there's no incentive for them to 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 change, and that's been my position since the '90s. By the way, I've, I, I, even long before they went woke, I've been trying to argue that we should we should starve them with money so they get better. So yes, I, I'm with you. I I rarely see movies, so good luck with your movie. Yeah. I, it was, uh hopefully you i guess you'll probably look at or check a few reviews that's what i normally do so i only go if i know it's going to be uh decent Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't expect um uh Wallace and Gromit to have anything uh in the way of woke, uh at least but again, all I have are my hopes. So exactly <laughs> yeah. um yeah yeah. yes i was trying to i think well yeah i, I saw district nine I think I have. Oh yeah, I saw um, uh, Oppenheimer. So before that, I think the last movie, the movie before that was was either Wreck-It Ralph or uh, or District Nine, to give you an idea of how often I go to the movies. Yeah, the first one or the second one? Wreck it, Ralph. Ralph. Uh, first one. I might have actually. I might have seen both. I might have seen both. Yeah. Okay. Well, first one was pretty I good. Second one sucked. Distinctly, uh, you know, I distinctly remember seeing the first one. I'm not sure about the second one, actually. Yeah, the first one was was first. Wreck it, Ralph was pretty good. Second one was uh, it was Okay. getting on the woke side. I don't. I, I hated it. I Okay. You know what? I'm sure I haven't seen the second one. Um, yep. Uh, Okay. yeah. <laughs> Don't bother. Now I think about it. Now I think about it. I've only seen the first one. Uh, yeah. So I think Wreck It Ralph and before that, I can't remember which one. And then District Nine, I can't recall which of those occurred Yeah. first. But yeah, then Oppenheimer. So I'll go years before between seeing, seeing movies at the cinema. Yeah, to be sure. But if they want to start, I mean, Woke's, uh, Hollywood, Woke Hollywood is doing it, is now starting to, to step back on that as well. So uh, we'll see. Yeah, to be sure. Yeah, and that's um, I think that's all I got. No worries. I have my usual ending spiel. Let's do it. Okay. As of uh, November 2024, a warrant is outstanding for the arrest of Zoe McClellan in relation to charges of kidnapping, child stealing and child custody deprivation. McClellan was reportedly residing in an apartment in River Ridge, Louisiana in April 2021 and may still be residing in the area. McClellan grew up in the area of Port Orchard, Washington State and may have returned to the area. Some sources believe that McClellan has left the United States and is residing in Canada or Costa Rica. Prior to disappearing, McClellan was known to use the alias Sarah Chandler. Anyone with any relevant information should contact the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. One day we will bring her to justice. Let's do it. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Catch See you later. you in two weeks. Bye. Yep.